very happy and glad <coughs> that I can be here after seven years. So I actually uh, an alumni of this Spring College. Like I attended the 2016 version. Um, and after seven years, I have chance to come back here and just uh, do a little bit of tutorial on the, what uh, I am interested in now. And uh, as you have seen over the last two days uh, in CUNY lectures, so now we uh, want to make a physics style model for some biological system. And um, um, so CUNY will give you a broad overview of all of his uh, attempt and all of his, uh, his model he has been developing uh, over many years. Uh, today I will just focus on one of his model, which is a bit different from the model you have seen uh, during the last two lectures. And um, um, so let's go to the model. So this is actually uh, the paper he published uh, like in 2007 on the evolutions of a gene regulatory network in which he consider two effects. So one is the mutations, no effect. So muta by mutation, no effect, which means that you have the, the chain in the genomes and the, another effect from the noise in the environment. So basically, the main questions, the main question is that uh, if you have noise, which represents the uh, uh, environmental effect, and if you have the uh, genetics, uh, uh, let's say it's a mutational effect. So this is environmental effect. Uh, if you have these two components and both of them can act simultaneously uh, on a biological system, then depending on the interplay between the first and the two, the system, there will, the system will display some emergent behavior. And that emergent behavior is something that you can interpret as a phenotype. So phenotype in this particular context of that model, for instance, uh, is understood as uh, the gene expression level. So you have a, a bunch of uh, gene that are connected in some network. And then for each of the gene, you have a state variable xi. And xi, for simplicity, you can make it between 0 and 1. And then the state of this gene regulatory network is characterized by this factor of n component, when n is the number of genes. So this vector, the configurational, uh, the vector of configuration of the genes is a phenotype in this context. And the specific network structure and the, uh, so not only the network structure, but the strength of the couplings constant between the genes are understood as a genotype. So um, basic, uh, uh, so the basic idea is the following. So if you have these two component system, so the first is genotype, the second is phenotype, how do they affect each other? And um, in the more traditional setting, um, what uh, is considered is that you fix the genotype, which means that you fix the network configuration, you don't change it, and um, you only observe the dynamic of the phenotype. So you will have some um, dynamical system corresponding to the dynamic of the, the phenotype. And so the new component coming into play from Kuni model is he consider that phenotype also involved, but on a slow time scale. So this dynamic is on the fast time scale. So you have a couple of uh, two dynamics happen on different time scale, and one will affect the other. 
So you create a feedback loop between the two components. You have the genotype affect the phenotype dynamic, and phenotype uh, on its own will affect also the genotype. So you have a feedback loop between the two, which make the so-called notation in in the literature coevolutions. So the system that have that kind of structure, uh, like you have one type of degree of freedom, and you have another type of degree of freedom, and if they if they have the dynamic couple in such a way that the evolution of one affects the other, then it will be called coevolutionary system. And uh, in that kind of uh, system, which uh, go beyond the standard uh, dynamical system uh, framework, you can observe a lot of uh, interesting behavior. So, say again, my task is not to to try to do some tutorial to show you how to uh, make a simulation of this kind of model, but uh, more or less like inspired by Kuni style, we will try to uh, go through some basic uh, concept and how to formalize this structure, right? So how to formalize this kind of coevolution system. And uh, I already sent a code to the secretary of the workshop of the Spring College. So after ending this session, you can just uh, get the code and then work through it yourself. Of course, I will show a bit uh, how uh, the code is structured and the basic uh, behavior during the tutorial session. But the first idea is to get a general picture of uh, what we are trying to do. So, okay, now come back to the first step. Um, I, um, okay, yeah, it's there. The sources of the noise is some maybe for simplicity as in physics, you can consider it as a term of fluctuation. So you couple the system to some heat bath, then it produces some fluctuation. So this is the noise. So this is why I call it environmental effect. But so this is your system and this is the environment. The system is coupled to the environment, but it also has some intrinsic property. So the intrinsic property in this context is the genetic uh, network. So the network structures are couple of different genes. So the question to be asked and to be answered here is what is the uh, interplay between the external condition and the uh, intrinsic internal property of a system and how it will result in the emergent behavior in the sense of physics. So connective motion, like uh, in condensed matter physics, yeah? Is there any other question? So this is a general picture before we go to the specific detail how to model this system, maybe how to run the code of blah, blah, but uh, this is the uh, thing that I am trying to show you. So now let's go to this specific uh, uh, part. So you have two components, right? You remember that you have the phenotype and you have the genotype. So first we consider the phenotype. Uh, so the phenotype is represented by this vector of n component, right? So the one that I brought over there, you have a vector of uh, n component, which means that you want to uh, have a map that showed you the, how the system evolved over time, right? And so yesterday, more or less, Kuni saw the deterministic system. But in this model, you will consider some effect of noise as a, this is what we are interested in. And starting free from this general structure, one specified case, and maybe I wrote it out here so that you can see it better. This kind of equation, you will see it quite a lot in many different contexts. I first write down, then I uh, say what, in, in which context and in which kind of model you can observe it. So you have the derivative, the time derivative of the uh, gene i, right? Gene i is just one uh, component, yeah? And here you will have the decay. Uh, every, every one of you have seen it in the previous lecture, right? Why you need that? Just to make the system about it. 
if you don't have that decay, everything go to unbounded regime. Uh, and then you have this tangent hyperbolic function of something. And then you have the noise. So first of all, why this is tangent hyperbolic? Actually, any sigmoid function should work. So by sigmoid function, I mean the function that go from zero to one here. Even x can go to infinite, right? And the tangent hyperbolic function is just something go from minus one to one. So as a physicist, you love the symmetry. So this is why you want to have minus one and one, for instance. So this is just for simplicity. Actually, the Hill function today you see can also be related to that one. So anyway, uh, this is just to give you some argument why the dynamic is started by this function. Now we need to specify the argument, right? Any uh, one of you have some idea of what is the argument inside that should be? Remember the question you want to see, how the effect of noise and, uh, and uh, system property affects the dynamic of the genes. So here you see I showed you the noise, here is the decay. So you may guess this needs to be the system internal property, right? So, and now since you specify that the system, the component depend on each other via this network. So this need be to be a function of the graph representing the interaction between the genes, right? This, this is the, do you agree with that argument? The, the argument here, yeah? And the simplest way as a, in physics, you try to capture the, the common um, reasoning is that only pairwise interaction matter. Of course, you can consider high order interaction, the interaction between many components, simplex or complexes, so whatever, hyper edges. But for simplicity, you can just consider the pairwise interaction between two genes. Then here, the sum, you can uh, represent that kind of pairwise interaction by the sum over on the node J in the neighborhood of the node I. So this is my notation. So delta I represents the set of neighbor of I, and J belongs to that set of neighbor. And here is the way you represent the effect of the network structure on the state of the node I. So you see that this tangent is just what people know in the context of a neural network activation function, transfer function. So for those who know that already, so this will be the dynamic co-equation for one single node. Now for making it uh, like a bit easier and tractable, you can specify the noise here with some Y noise, right? So you can specify some uh, psi i and just the uh, the y noise and psi y, psi t price, and here is two sigma square and delta t minus t prime, something like that. So you consider the y noise for simplicity, but this will be the dynamical equations that you are interested in to, um, to study the dynamical evolution of this phenotype. So for a given network, the network that specify the inhibitory and uh, promoting interaction between the gene, what happened with the state of the gene? So this is basically the first step that we want to model, the dynamic of the first component of the system, the phenotype. You have any questions? No, no, it here not velocity. It is a state here. It is. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. I, I myself confused. Sorry about that. Sometimes I denote with the dot, and sometimes I. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Hi, I never have a proper discipline of networks, and so could you just talk a little bit more of the ten hyperbolic tangent and what is inside? You said it comes from. Networks so, uh, okay, so. I, I, I'm sorry if I don't make it clear enough. 
you have two uh, factors that can affect the dynamic of the phenotype. So this is a noise, you see. And the other need to come from the interaction between all the genes in the network, right? But of course, in the network, this particular genes is not connected to all other genes. It's only connected to a subset of the genes in the network. So this is the notation for the subset denoting the neighbor of I. And then all the neighbor of I can affect I, for instance. And this is how you represent the uh, effect of the genetic component of the network structure on the dynamic. OK? So far, so good? OK, so if there is no question, now we need to a little bit more uh, specific. So in the uh, disorder system, so the topic of my uh, most interest, uh, people normally consider different ensemble for that matrix. So it can be a, a Gaussian ensemble, for instance. So every JIJ is distributed according to some Gaussian distribution with zero mean and some variances. So as a starting point, you can try to simulate the uh, dynamic of this system with the assumption that the network is fixed, so the topology of the network is fixed, and the value of the coupling strength is distributed according to uh, Gaussian distribution, right? This is what the first step. No? Okay, now I can come back to this uh, picture. Okay. Oh. Does not work anymore? Wow. Okay, now it works, sorry. Oh, yeah? So why did you t uh, took a term like that? Why is the argument is like that? Like J I J X I. Why is not like something other? X I to the power of alpha or something. So, sorry, sorry? Why did you took this term like that? Argument? Like would it be like something X I to the power alpha higher order term in X I? Uh, why like we don't take the high order x cubic x square something, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's Just very simple. Remember what I said, it is 0 to 1. Or uh, maybe in this case, better to see it is minus 1 to 1. Then if you take the higher power, right, it just becomes smaller and smaller. And by the way, it is uh, very similar to the structure that you know in statical physics, like in easing model, you see, for instance. So. It's, uh, you consider the linear term, of course, because the uh, non-linear term is harder to deal with. And now I thank to you. I forgot one thing that I want to mention. You can put a factor beta here, similar to the role of the inverse temperature in statistical physics. So this will be the final equation with the beta here. You, of course, can set it to some number, it's just rescaling accordingly to the strength of this term of the JIJ, but if you want to make it explicit, you can write explicit here. What would be beta in this case? Uh, beta. So you can just write beta here as a parameter. It's also oh. fine. Oh. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, so these x's represent your phenotypic values, right? Yeah, the x represents the gene expression level. And you have uh, many genes. So each of the genes have its uh, value, xi here. But to specify the full phenotype, you need to specify the n-dimensional vector x. OK, so, so, so this you're writing? That this equation, you need to understand it is the equation. For instance, if I have 100 genes, you will have 100 of such equations. OK. So this and if you have 1,000 genes, of course, it goes to 1,000. So this vector is a representation of the phenotype, and each element of this vector is one gene, the expression yeah, of one the gene. Yeah, the expression of one gene, yeah. OK. And uh, you were talking about this interaction between genotype and phenotype, or the coevolution picture that you were talking about. This is so a general I, picture. We have not uh, reached that far. Ah, okay. okay. We so now was... specify again fixed uh, genotype. So this is the first step. We don't consider the coevolution yet. OK. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. So just to check if I understand, 
if there were no relations between the the genes, you would have like an additive gene thing, uh, like an additive gene model. Now, if this is zero, yes, if that is zero, what, what just, happens? If it's just zero, then you just have minus thick and noise. Okay, yeah. and what would that mean? Uh, this is a standard Langevin equation. You have the diffusion, Brownian motion part, and the read term. The read yeah. to what zero? But what would it mean biologically? I understand that, uh, but uh, biologically, what would that mean uh, if you don't have the gene relation? Okay, like this the just genes means will just simply change. something like that. If there is no interaction, there is no way to make the system order. So you know the central thing in. Uh, in physics, where you want to describe the transition between order and disorder phase. No interaction simply means just decay to the zero state. Everything it just becomes. Uh, so let's put it this way. So if all the x go to zero, uh, this is nothing that happened, interestingly, right? Because you want to see whether the gene can be on and off. And on is plus one and off is minus one. So if everything is zero, it's just a, how to call it, a sleeping state or? Okay. And everyone, anyone have the better name for that? If on the X is just zero? Yeah. <laughs> Dead state Turned or down. sleeping state, yeah. dormant state? Yes. Okay. What you would like to call? Turned it's like, like the paraphase, paramagnetic phase. So this is not an interesting behavior. So this is why you want to see the effect of interactions. Well. I'm sorry if I am not a good biologist to explain your no, question. No. So does it make sense you are trying to find the transition between phenotype to genotype? Uh, so is it what you are going to do? You are trying to find the transition between phenotype to genotype? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Wait a second. We go to that why. First, we need to understand at least the modeling framework. OK. So it's just the time evolution of the phenotype you are now studying. Uh, did I answer your question or yeah. still? OK. OK. So can I continue now? Can I move on? OK. So we will do just a simple uh, example. If I stimulate that dynamic, right, what kind of behavior I can, can I observe? Let me take a few examples for you. Um, this is with the evolutions. So as you guess. Okay, what happened here? Okay, so this may be uh, interesting for you because it's related to George's questions. So on the left-hand side are three representative trajectory of three random genes, so one, five, and 11. And on the right-hand side is a histogram, the distribution of the value of the genes at the final time. So this is the left and this is the right hand side picture. And uh, for a particular choice of beta, it's small enough. And sigma noise strength here is also kind of small. Can you see that? Things just decay to zero. Yeah, things decay to zero. It's a, the state may be just related to your question. But when um, you increase a bit the noise, for instance, way, if you increase a bit the, the, the noise, still, thing is not much interesting. It still fluctuates around zero. It just have a higher variances. Uh, and now if you consider the strong enough uh, uh, beta, so the inverse temperature, then you can have this kind of uh, picture, for instance. Now you see it's uh, more interesting, right? You have some component go to one, so x1 here go to one, which means that uh, it's steady on, this gene is on, uh, starting after some change in time. But for other genes, it can be high like limit cycle, so it just uh, not settled down in some unique uh, fixed point attractor. And so, uh, uh, of course, you can see nice share with you the code, you can play around with different set of parameters and uh, see more uh, complicated behavior, but basically there will be uh, three regimes. One is a zero state, everything just decay to zero, right? At the small beta, as you seen in the first picture here. Um, where is that first picture? 
then you will just see everything just decay to zero. And you will see some uh, more interesting state which uh, genes can turn on, and some of them still have persistent uh, like limit cycle like behavior. And as a state in which own will just go either to on and off. So, and uh, this is the basic, okay, yeah? My question has to do about the fitness function because I'm trying to understand the... Now uh, I will explain to that. First, we, we just think it simply. Yes, yeah, so the fitness, when, when I write a fitness here, basically uh, it's a little bit of a, um, I abuse a bit of the notations. I should call it just the final state, the, the state of the genes at the final time point. So you just basically plot. So you have this vector, right? X at the final, in that uh, picture, it's just at the time 400. And then you plot the distribution of the gene at that time. Of course, you can run it longer. Every time you run it longer and you observe a different time window, you will see slightly changes. But this picture will be something established once the system enters the stationary state. Yeah? So far, so good, no? More questions? So. How I pick the sigma? <laughs> this one? This is a component in the equation. No, no, no. Exactly. This is a sigma, this is a noise chunk. It, oh. it specifies the correlation of the y noise term. So. For, for this particular equation, you have two parameters. One is the inverse temperature, and the other is the noise change. Of course, I don't want to go into detail. When you, um, when you write the code for that system, you have to specify a bit more. So um, you need to, for instance, specify the link density. So you want to make the network dense or spark, and then you uh, generate the network of uh, gene regulation, right? As I said, it's typical to be chosen as a, a random Gaussian distribution. So once you have this network specified and you specify the beta and sigma, then basically you just write two lines of code to simulate the ODE. So it's, it's not that uh, uh, complicated, right? But the behavior of this super simple model, so the model which basically uh, I written, have written it here, can generate a very different dynamical behavior. So um, just a command, again, if this J is existed as a quench random variable, so for those who know the uh, terminologies, uh, quench means the coupling constant here, it fixed over time. It does not change over the course of the evolution of the genes. So if the, the coupling is quenched, then there is a theoretical framework, the so-called dynamical mean fin theory, which has been uh, developed to make some analytical statement regarding to this equation. So you go, for those who want to know it, you can check some old paper by Sompolinsky or more recent review by John Head or Tom Cullen. So this, if, if you are interested in solving that equation, just come to me, I can try to use some uh, reference. Okay, um, but this now is just the first part of the model. You remember that we have the second component, right? The genotype. And this component will be very important because the behavior I showed you here for a given network of genes uh, interaction will be changed quite dramatically when you have the evolution of the genotype. Well, by the way, it's a, it's a common for the mathematical treatment to assume that the genotype involved on slower time scale so that you can do some kind of uh, adiabatic uh, enumeration or how they call it, uh, uh, parcel alleling, right? How they call it in the spin glass literature, it's a so-called parcel alleling approach. 
But in, the, in this particular model, Cooney also assumed that the evolution of the genotype happened on the slow time scale. But now this is not for the sake of mathematical treatment anymore, but it really reflects the, the reality. Because in reality, you expect that the genome takes millions of years to inform. So it, it happened much slow on a much slower time scale than the phenotype. And now we go to the second step, how to model the evolution of the genotypes. Yeah, is there any question? Because this second part will be more interesting for you, and I just want to make sure that every one of you on the same page. Yeah? Okay, now let's go to the second part. Which, okay, now let's go to the second part. La, 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 la. So now I will try to write it in the in an algorithmic manner, so that uh, after reading through, you can come up with your own code, no? So let's call it step one. In the step one, you simulate this system of ODE, right? Uh, to, get the, to get the state of the phenotype. Now at the end of this step one, we go to the step two, and now to answer your question, we need to define the fitness. Because uh, what is a fitness? Uh, so fitness in the bio biological um, understanding, it is just the proportional to the reproduction rate. But uh, you can think about it as a function of the phenotypes. So um, if you interpret the fitness as a function of the phenotype, so the fitness need to depend on this vector x, right? Yeah, because fitness is based on the observable chart of the system, and then it's a function of this observable chart. This is the x. And now everything boils down to how you specify this function, right? If you make that function too complicated, then you may get into trouble. So you want to make that function simple enough. So again, now in physics, if you have a state vector, what is the simplest function that you can have. Which function? It's just, uh, maybe you want to make it like that, right? Like the marketization, right? You just sum over all the components. Yeah? And then you divide by their components, the number of components. So basically, you consider the mean activities of the genes as a fitness function, right? And so, there is a little uh, more than that in Kuni model. It's the sense that actually he divides the set of the gene into target and uh, non-target. So to make things maybe more interesting, because uh, uh, his assumption is that the biological system consists of two parts. One is a functional part, so which is responsible for performing some function and some, you can call it helper or uh, assistant part, which does not play any role in determining the fitness. So maybe here the sum is not over all the node, but over the subset of the node belong to this target uh, set of the gene. Yeah, but anyway, it does not matter. It's uh, just a very specific way to model it. You can just think about it as a mean marketization for a, which uh, for a given set of genes. So now this is a step two. You define the fitness based on the steady state behavior of the gene dynamic, right? So here I forgot to say that. Mathematically speaking, you want to consider the x infinite. So x infinite is a limit of t go to infinite of that x, which is involved according to that stochastic dynamic. But in simulation, of course, you cannot uh, run the simulation infinitely long. So actually, this is just a t after some transient time. So you run the dynamic long enough, you assume that the system settles down into the steady state, and then you start measuring the phenotype, and then you compute the fitness. Are you okay with that? Hmm? 
No questions, right? Yeah. No, but that's the biggest argument you make is like it's an average. Yeah. That's that's I don't know, but that what that I is uh, I mean I don't I don't get what the sum is over the I what does it represent? It's like for each thing I'm seeing number H H five. Yeah. And the I is all over time. No, 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 no. I here is the index, the label of the gene. Okay. I am gene number one, you number eight, yeah? We sum each other. Yeah, we sum each other. We form a collective. Okay, okay. So we, we, we want to think about the emergent behavior, right? Okay. Collective behavior of, over a large set of degree freedom. And that's, I'm gene one, but that's X means my, what, my, what observation? Like my, what? The gene state that you got from here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, how can we define the target cells inside big D? So it's a very interesting question. It's just very important. I also ask Kuni many times, how do we distinguish target from non-target? Actually, in this kind of abstract framework, you can assign, so gene number one is target, gene number two is non-target. So this is uh, a cho choice. But uh, maybe in the realistic setting, you need to have a, a way to distinguish between target and non-target. So, so far in his model, he just predefined certain number of genes and their indexes. They are the target genes. The rest, the remaining, is non-target. Yeah? Okay, I can continue, right? Uh, so we specify the fitness. Now, as in biology, uh, you have the selection process. So selection process is a process acting on choosing the best fit uh, in the uh, population, right? So how did he model this uh, uh, selection process? Now it's in more tricky. Uh, where can I uh, clean it? Okay, let me clean it here. So let's put it this way. At t equals zero, you have a, let's put it this way, you have a five different network. So you, if you have five different genotypes. Huh? So each of that have one network. Yeah? It's, it's, uh, it's of the individual in the population have one network that is draw as a random instance from the ensemble of random matrices that's specified by the random uh, Gaussian distribution, right? So you have five network at the initial time, um, and then you run the dynamic. And then at the end of the day, you compute the fitness for each of that network, yeah? So it gives you F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. Yeah? You have four different uh, fitness functions corresponding to four di uh, five different fitness functions corresponding to, sorry, five different value corresponding to five different network. And then you just rank them. Yeah? You need to, to rank them according to some order. So, for instance, if you observe F1 smaller than F2, and maybe smaller than F5, then F4. And then F3 is the maximum. Now, for simplicity, Kuni specify something like only the first, like the, the two most uh, highest fitness uh, network can survive, can reproduce to the next time step. So this is how um, it is chosen among all the network. So you choose two among five, which means that the selection pressure is like 40%, right? You choose two network among these five network, and this is a step three. You specify, uh, you choose uh, NS network among the total M network. So M equal five here, and NS equal two here. You choose two among the five network, and then you do random notation. So, the random mutation is the following uh, simple recipe. So maybe many of you have know 
this uh, keyword again uh, beforehand, rewiring. So rewire just means that if this is gen, uh, gene I and this is gene J, the mutation happens in the way that you remove the connection between I and J and you flip it to J to K, for instance. You do it randomly. So you choose a pair of gene at random and then you create a link that had not existed before also at random. So this you perform on the last two networks here, on the two networks that have the highest fitness value. Is this clear? Because this is a crucial step. Otherwise, the dynamic is just simply simulating this evolution of phenotype without alternating the, the network structure in the population. Yeah, you, you do the mutation step only for the top fitness, uh, top fittest uh, network, yeah? No, 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 don't worry. So um, what you got uh, till here was like some kind of optimization of the some things, and then once you get the, like, let's say the best uh, two colonies, you now you mutate like, a higher level thing, like, um, I don't... Yeah, yeah, you can think about that way. Okay. So you have a system which operates on two levels. Mm. The low level is the level of phenotype, and the higher level is the level of genotype. And on the level of genotype, what you operate, as what you said, you try to maximize its fitness function. So this is how you retain only the top fitness uh, network among all the network that you simulate at the beginning. Thank you. Yeah, and once you make this random uh, mutation of the, oh, sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to clarify about the rewiring. So it seems like there is a lot of parameters that would be involved, say how many uh, connections would you rewire or like do you want to do, so yeah, how do yeah. you define those? So one thing to, again, just uh, because the assumption, the underlying assumption is uh, evolution happen on a very slow time scale which also means that you, end, you typically assume the mutation rate is very small. So to your question, which means that at uh, any given time step, any given generation of the network, what you want to mutate, you rewire only one link. So you kill one link and you create one link, and this is how you make the new network into the next generation. Okay, so... I'm a little bit confused about what the rewiring means in terms of the changes in like my values, for example. So I have a value yeah. for each node. Each node has a value. I rewire, and what does it mean for you? You don't rewire the value of the node. You rewire the connection between them. Okay, so I rewire like the term that has the. So it's uh, the same like in the social media. Okay. You same. instead following Chum, you follow me. And for the next generation, yeah. I have the rewire. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Just to recap, you have the equal uh, number of networks as the number of phenotypes, is that correct? Yeah. And then for each one of them has their own dynamic and yeah. in the Yeah, each of them you have a, their own dynamic and at the end you compute the fitness. Okay, and for the top fitness you take those networks and rewire them a bit and take it to the next generation? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And just to be sure, this rewriting process is random? Yes, it's random. Okay. You pick a pair of nodes at random. And you uh, remove the interaction between them. And then you randomly choose another pair of nodes, and then you create link between them. OK, and how, much, how, how many connections do we change along generation? One. Only one. Okay. Only one. Most of the time, only one. Okay, no more questions. Okay, so basically this go through three steps, right? Once you finish the step three, 
You go back one. You make that cycle many times. So each uh, generation consists of three steps. Just repeat it, and you see what comes out from that dynamic way. Now let's see what can we find. Um, Okay, let's go with the involution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sorry that I forgot I need also to specify uh, two additional that can it uh, observable to, to make the thing more interesting. So, uh, where can I go? Okay, let's do it here. So you have this phenotype, right? It's involved according to this stochastic dynamic. Yeah? So even for a given network, for a given network, if you run this uh, dynamics, you simulate it every time you have slightly different right, random trajectory, right? So for a given network, actually you can define the mean value of the x as a function of the network. So let's put it this way. Let's put it with a bar, maybe it's better notation. And then you specify some distribution with this graph to the x and then of the value of the fitness of the x, for instance, you will take it as a function of the g. So this one as a function of the network. So basically, you consider the mean of the x for a given network. G here stands for network, right? Yeah? It's just a quantity. And you can do it for a given node i. So you can marginalize it. Yeah? Sorry, the distribution here is over what? In the sense that uh, the idea is that you have multiple uh, uh, The distribution here no? is generated by this uh, random ensemble of trajectory. Yeah, so looking at it uh, ideally for a very long time. So the idea yeah. is that you have uh, alternative um, yeah, stable you can, state. Yeah. You can have multiple attractor as I showed yeah. you in the first place. So you have a distribution of the uh, state of the node i at, uh, in the stationary phases because this is inherent disorder here. You can end up having multiple attractors cases. So under the assumption that the system does not go to chaotic regimes and in the presence of multiple uh, attractors, then you can specify that uh, distribution uh, for, the, uh, not for the state of a, of a gene I for a given network. So this is one quantity, and then you can consider the variant of that quantity. So the variant of that quantity, xi, for instance, yeah? The variant of it, you denote it as a VIP. So VIP here is what the Kunikon is, isogenic variance. So for a given network, you run the stochastic dy uh, dynamic, and you end up having in, dip, uh, end up in different state and then you take the ensemble average over the set of state, and then you can consider the variance, right, in that ensemble. And this is the first sort of randomness. Now you look at this recipe, you see that you have the updating rule because of the rewiring for the genes, so which means you have second sort of randomness. Naturally, for second sort of randomness, you would expect to see another type variances. And this is what he calls mutational variance. So the mutational variance is first need to be defined uh, as the following. So once you have this, uh, let's call it XIG, right? Here, XIG with that. And then you consider the distribution of the gene. So the di distribution over the network ensemble, right? And then you specify a measure in that space. This will give you another vector, another value. We call it xi. Now this is the average over 
the average. So this is the average you get for a given network. And then, because you have an ensemble of network, you can define a second average, which is this guy. And of course, corresponding to this guy, you will have a variance. And this variance is the one that we call mutational variance. Yeah? I don't know what uh, level of detail that you expect. If you want, you can talk more in detail about that. Otherwise, I will just go quite fast into the, to the main conclusion of the paper and how we get to that main conclusion. Are you clear how do I define this fit of the first function? No? Okay, just. Yeah, yeah, so okay. of course you, in order to compute that, yes. in order to compute that, you take into consideration the time scale separation assumption. Mm -hmm. So once you set that the time scale is different between the dynamic of the phenotype and the genotype, mm -hmm. effectively, during the course of evolution of the phenotype, the genotype are fixed. Since they are fixed, there is only one randomness now, which is a randomness play in this equation. So that is how you compute the first quantity. Perfect. Yeah? And now, since you have the evolution, which is basically the mutation of the network, yeah? Then even you start with the same uh, phenotype after you get into this second step, mm -hmm. because of the law here, right? The random rewiring law, you will get to different state, and then you need to compute the variance of the steady state when you perform that random rewiring. So this is the second quantity here. Yeah? yeah? This is the confusing, or? No, I'm no. sorry about that. This is the first time I explained that this will be not clear for you because of the way I explained it. So I'm happy to repeat and explain any questions. I can go through the code, but now I just want to emphasize the physics and the main question first, because otherwise, it's, as I said, you get a copy of it uh, through the email, and then you can play at your own page, then it's better, right? You can look through every single line, figure out what is the reasoning behind that. But the main idea is, say again, we want to consider these two effects, the uh, noise effect and the mutational effect on the dynamic of this gene regulatory network. And okay, so you have two variances. This is a VIP, it's a variant of that guy. And okay, I need to clean something. Sorry, that one I need to clean. And you have the variant of that uh, XIG here. So that quantity is what you can call it uh, VG. So you denote it VG. And here you denote it VIP. And here is a variant of XI for a given gene. Okay, so you have two variances, yeah? And the most important conclusion in Cooney paper is that the relationship exists between the two. Actually, it is an inequality. So it can go both sides. So do you expect that there is some phase transition when the two equal, the two quantity can uh, become equal at some critical value of the noise, sigma, but for small noise, you will have VIP smaller than VG. And when you increase the noise, two things become equal. And if you keep increasing the noise, VIP become larger than VGs. So this is the main conclusion of that model. Of course, I am sorry that I'm not good at biology to explain to you on the uh, mm, how to say, biological relevance of that inequality, but to, um, suddenly speaking, we just uh, mean that you have a constraint on the evolution of the system, because it's a relation between two level dynamics. One operates at the phenotype level and another on the genotype level. 
So depending on the strength of the noise, you have some different relationship between the two dynamics. And it's reflected in this inequality. Now I will show some behavior and then we go to the code for those who know it. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's uh, stick with this first example. So small noise, yeah? As uh, I uh, told you, small noise, you will have this mutational variances, VG larger than VIP. So this is what observed by simulating this dynamic. Yeah? And uh, if you increase the bit, the noise, let's increase it. Uh, what do you observe? So this is now equal 0 0.1. Um, if you increase this to 0 0.5, you still see the same inequality hole. So the VIP, the isogenic variant, is smaller than um, a VG, the mutational variance. Um, but then once you approach the critical value here, seem to be sigma equal to 1 in this case, right? You see that the two variants become more or less statistically equal to each other, yeah? Um, and the, this, if you keep increasing the noise, now you observe that this hole, so VIP will become larger than VG beyond some critical level of the noise. So just I saw a demonstration of this inequality, how it's working in practice. Uh, you have a question? Uh, please, could you give us some intuition about why the BIP has a linear relations with the noise? Uh, so, the, uh, um, so intuitive uh, explanation like, of that? Like if right? I get you, you mean the BIP increase as we increase the noise? Yeah, this is true. So the VIP, of course, according to that dynamic. Sorry, I, I just maybe rewrite the curve. So, yeah, it's, this is true. This is the tangent hyperbolic here, and then the noise term, which proportional you know, to sigma. So the VIP, as you observe, it should only increase with increasing the noise strength. It's true. So my question is, can you give us some intuitions why this is possible? So the one way to think about it, uh, let's think about it in the, uh, the physical picture. So it's not a correct metaphor to map this system to a spin glass system, because in the spin glass system, you have the symmetric interaction dij, and then you can define the Lyapunov exponent, and then you can uh, 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 like map that picture to some uh, evolution in some free energy landscape. And then you can explain it quite intuitively, like you can end up in multiple attractors corresponding to, to have the phase space broken into multiple ergodic components. But here, the JIJ is asymmetric, so it does not work the picture of the Lyapunov function. So what at least you can think of, and at, at, at least if you still remember what I showed you in the first part of the tutorial is that for the small noise case, the system can end up in multiple attractors. And each of them can be think of uh, as a, some kind of a metastable long-lived state. And if the system just it, with the initial condition turns out to be in the basin of attraction of that uh, metastable state, it gets into that. And uh, because of that, if you consider this PG, then there, are, there is a huge differences between different uh, attractor. So if the system in one attractor and you compare with the system in another attractor, you can observe the tremendous variances between different attractor here, even for the small noise case. This is what really you observe when you stimulate this dynamic. But then when you increase the noise, actually the noise act in a beneficial way. So normally noise is associated to some harmful effect to the system. But here the noise on the opposite, it can be kind of resemble to the so-called uh, sto uh, stochastic resonance system in the sense that the noise actually stabilize the system. 
and help you to, so if you think of this in terms of some landscape picture, the noise just sharpen and make the landscape become more full now. So in the case with small noise, there are multiple uh, local minima in the landscape picture. But in the case with noise increase beyond some critical value, one among those peaks uh, get deepens. And, and then this will be the most uh, probable state of the system, and it's reduce the variances uh, across the no a network. Yeah? No, I don't understand what you said about the multiple attractors, because if you go to the small noise case, the isogenic variance is very small. No, 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 no. Actually, correct me if I am wrong, because you are more expert on ecosystem. So in a bunch of paper recently by Tobias Gala or Bulin or whoever, Van Kai, they saw the dynamic without the noise of the load carbon terror model, generalized load carbon terror, for instance, right? for specification. You actually observe multiple attractors. That, that I understand, but what I mean is that if I look at the picture in the case of sigma very small, you see that the isogenic variance is not, not these pictures, the one for uh, sigma equal to 0 0.01. Let me go back to that, 0, 0 0.1. Where is that, 0, 0 0.1? Yeah, or this one. The variance is extremely small. So it looks like uh, you don't have multiple attractors in this case, right? No, it's, uh, it's really small, right? It, so it, you have one attractor, and then there are perturbation around these attractors? Yeah, this is small, random uh, exactly. no, mutation all, uh, with respect to that attractor. But actually, it can also be so that in, in some given value of beta, it can end up into multiple attractors and limit cycle, as I saw in the beginning. Yeah? So the, the idea is that for very small noise, the system can end up in very different type of dynamic. And, and then this is uh, the observation that the VI, uh, VGs is larger than VIP. It's quite counterintuitive. When I first talked to Goody, I also don't make sense of that. How can it be? Small noise, deterministic system, one single attractor. Why in small noise case you have multiple attractor? I don't get that. So it's also my, it takes me quite a while to understand that, to appreciate that fact. You can simulate that uh, dynamic uh, and you can figure it out. And this is also written in the paper if you want to, to have some uh, like intuitive picture of what you just uh, asked. So the, the dynamic in the small noise and the, and the large noise can be mapped into different type of landscape picture. Even though, say again, there's no way to define the Apuno function for that system with asymmetric coupling. So, yeah? And, and the other question is, the, the ensemble of the networks is the, is basically the distribution of the networks within uh, a population which is evolving, or is like a random drawing of the networks? Only a T0. A T0 is a Gaussian random ensemble. Okay. But then, after the T0, every time, so at every generation, you mutate the system according to that fitness selection, and then it will become not random anymore. No, no yeah, that, that, that's my question. So the VG, when you calculate the VG in the picture, yeah, you are looking at the VG of an evolved population? Of the inborn okay. population, okay. yeah, of the inborn population. So this is why, actually, you see in that picture, the VGs, it plot as also a function of the generation. So if I just specify the network at T0, and I fix that, it makes no sense to plot this kind of picture. So here should be right as a function of time to make it clearer. I guess just a bit of clarification. Why are we, um, since for your example, you have five networks and you chose the top two, wouldn't um, say the number of a uh, number of uh, two networks matter like in the long run, and at the same time, um, it uh, why why the first two not the last two? Why are we choosing like the first? You choose the first two because it's the one which have the highest fitness. So yeah. the biological evolution happened in the way that only the fittest species survive, the one which have lower fitness extinct. 
Uh, I see. So, yeah. yeah. So most of the time, um, say for example, for genetic algorithms, those that are in the last parts are the ones that were are, are mutated with their genes. So, like it's just um, new to me that the first parts are mutated. So back to the first question. Um, uh, how do we select two? How do we select the number of networks that need to be mutated? So actually, um, the model behavior is quite robust with respect to changing of that number. So you can choose two, you can choose four, for instance. Of course, if you choose many, if you keep many network with low fitness value, then you will have to broaden the distribution of the fitness. But qualitatively, the model is so that it's uh, this inequality whole, and it's not that too sensitive with respect to the exact number that is specified here. Is this true, right, Kuni? So if, if this is too weak, maybe, so if you select only nine from 10, maybe the evolution may be slow or it, does, it may not work so well. And so it depends on the selection pressure, but as long as the selection works, maybe this behavior at the end. So I have a question. Do these results is still true if we change the fitness function? Because I guess that even in biology, fitness can be something kind of tricky to define. So if we just invent a different function for, for our fitness, for the way we are measuring it, does we get to the same result or can be a completely different Oh, thing? thank you. It's a very good question. Actually, I asked the same question to Kuni some time ago. <clears throat> because I also, I, I love simplicity. So of course, the uh, marketization is the simplest way to, uh, to compute the fitness. It actually turns out, according to my recent uh, calculation, that any monotonically increasing function of the x will work the same way. So no matter you have the sum over the x i, and you have the f of x i, which f of x i is some monotonically increasing function, you will have the same behavior. Of course, if you take it a uh, parabon function or some weird function, the behavior may disappear. It's a little counterintuitive to me that um, you are making the fittest phenotypes mutate. Because if a phenotype or uh, yeah, okay, if a phenotype is, uh, or if a genotype is the fittest, it means, at least intuitively, it means that all the other genotypes on the fitness landscape should tend towards this fittest genotype value, right? But what you are doing in this model is you, you're taking this fittest genotype and you're making that genotype mutate to a different value. So that is not making a lot of sense to me. Could you please explain that? Oh, this is a very good question. I'm afraid that I cannot answer it correctly. So the point is that um, maybe it's important to keep updating yourself, right? So that your population always get better and better. Like, I think it's quickly remember some paper, like human being get smarter every 20 years. So even the fish can get, uh, get go through the selection and improve it, no? Okay, could you answer yeah. your question? Yeah, of course. So even after, maybe we are a little bit fitted, but still mutation occurs for the next generation. So the mutation still remains, so there's, there is some genetic change. And, but when VG is small, that means even if you change a little bit genetic by genes, by mutation, if VG is very small, then the change is very small. So if, even if you, have, if you have a fittest one, then if you put some mutation, it's still basically fit. fit. So, so that means so if the system goes to small VG, then that is uh, very robust to the mutation change. So, so that is good for biological 
Sister. Uh, what you were asking, no? The the thing they are doing when they are killing uh, all the other ones, they are saying like that is the like, success of the population and just takes over. They are like keeping a step to do it more fast. Okay. Any else? Is there any other questions? Okay, so no way. Now I I will spend the last 15 minutes just to show you the <coughs> the code. Um, I think Guni will uh, explain this uh, model. I think at some other point in his uh, eight or nine lecture, and then you can ask him more specific biologically related question. Uh, it's not my task, sorry. Um, uh, let's see uh, where the code that I store. Mm, uh, okay, so this is the code. Um, <clears throat> so first, as uh, I uh, told you at the beginning of the uh, session, right? You need to have a simple ODE uh, integration for the dynamic of the gene, right? You have the the <clears throat> decay term, the noise, and the tangent hyperbolic function. And then you have some other function to capture the step two and step three of the Sorry. algorithm. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, uh, okay. Like, w what is the physical interpretation of uh, the transition VG, VIP? I don't understand that. The meaning? Yeah. So the meaning is it captures two different dynamical behavior. In one case, when the VIP is smaller than VG here, you can have a uh, multiple architecture and you can have a, the, the system can get chopped into low fitness state. And when you have the opposite way, VIP less than VG, actually the system get to much higher fitness state. And the system actually in the, in the more detailed discussion in Kuni paper, this is the way he explained the emergence of robustness. Let me go to that. Uh, where the paper again? Da, da, da. Uh, sorry, okay, is this which one? Yeah. So, the beginning, at the beginning I mentioned that what uh, we are interested in is the relationship between the noise effect and the genetic effect, right? So, the VIP represents the effect of the noise and the VG represents the effect of the, the genetic mutations. So you want to understand the relationship between these two effects. And this is the conclusion that draw from the model, that depending on the strength of the noise, they can have different relationships, and these different relationships emerge under different dynamical behaviors. Yeah? Is this uh, okay? Okay, so now it's uh, back to this part. So the first step is to simulate this uh, equation for the gene expression uh, dynamic, right? And then you need to have the uh, chunk of code to simulate this step two and step three. So basically, as I said at the beginning, you need to create a random ensemble of uh, JIJ matrices. And then you just... Uh, do uh, a bit of, uh, how to say, uh, specification according to that picture. You specify the number of the network that you want to simulate. And then for each of them, you go back to the step one. You simulate the phenotype dynamic. And then you go to the next step of computing the fitness. And then you choose uh, the best fit. So for each of the uh, uh, network among the top fitness uh, in the population, you do the mutation. So you copy all the connection from their parents, and then you rewind with some probability to make the new network. And this done is uh, no, no magic here. You can just 
try to do it. I stare the code and then you play that. If you have some questions, come back to me. If you want to know more about maybe uh, analytical argument or some literature on that, I'm happy to answer. By the way, to to your question, Jacopo, uh, uh, I will. I think that the picture makes a wrong impression here because um, even in this case, uh, this is too small. Okay, not this case. Let's uh, go back to that theta equal one here. Uh, actually, the, in the orange line here, you divide by factor one over n because you, you don't compute exactly xi, but you will compute xi over n. So this factor subtract the the amplitude and then you think that is it's almost no fluctuation. Actually, there is fluctuation there between different value of the xi. So just to answer your question, that maybe it's not clear why it seems like almost zero fluctuation. There is a fluctuation there. What I meant is that if you have multiple attractors, you should expect to have a finite uh, uh, VIP as you go yeah. to sigma, yes. as sigma goes to zero plus. Yes, this is true. But the, the, uh, as I okay. want to say, it's because of the, okay. the, how to say, because you try to represent two quantity on the same scale and which have different amplitude, and then it just makes the impression that is zero, but it's actually not zero. It's a, you can go back to the, if you don't have the evolution, so you still can see the fluctuation, right? If you don't have the evolution, so this is no evolution case, and for the same value of the sigma zero to one, you still have the fluctuation, of course. You, you have the random trajectory induced by this noise, so. Okay. So I think I can finish now. Any other questions? No? Okay, thanks a lot.